Hello there. I'm Ruth Chambers, and this is the Chambers Street Theater. And of course, it's not just me who does this show. There are three of us. The other two you can't see because they're in the control room over to the side there. And that would be Alex Silva Satter and Bryce Parker, who are technical people, and the three of us work on this show so that we can do a halfway decent job each week. And they've been coming up with some nice special effects, and I th I'm sure you'll appreciate them as you see them. It's uh, one thing to sit here and read a story, and that can be done, but I think it makes it a little more interesting when we have some pictures and some special effects, and well, it just makes for a more interesting half hour. Well, the Chamber Street Theater, uh, was my sort of invention. <laughs> there really was a Chambers Street Theater in New York in the 1840s. It was on Chambers Street, which is a street that's still there in New York. And of course, the theater is long gone, but that's how we got the name of the show. And I've written a book, because I got involved with living history over in Old Sacramento, The Weight of Gold. And I've just finished the, uh, well, the expanded second edition, and it's going to the publisher. And I'll let you know when it's available. Uh, but I like to read some of my stories, but mostly we read a lot of Mark Twain. But today we're going to read not Mark Twain, <laughs> so it's going to be a different kind of show. We're sort of calling this half hour survival because we've deal with various survival issues. And the first story we're going to read is one I wrote from my second book, The Expanded Weight of Gold. And this one's called One Shot, and that's chapter 41. James, it's time to get dinner. And with those words, James got his rifle and one bullet and left the house. James was walking into the trees where he knew he could find something. He moved quietly towards the stream. He knew animals would go there late in the day. He worked his way into the low-growing bushes. He was close enough and hidden enough. The breeze was away from the stream. Animals would not smell him. James carefully took one shell out of his pocket and put it in the rifle. If he missed, it was no dinner for him. This would be his fourth day with a miss and no place at the dinner table. Those were the family rules to train a shooter. One rifle, one bullet each day until the shooter got smart enough and good enough to get his game. Each time James missed, it was no dinner for him when the rest of the family enjoyed the main meal of the day with his favorite biscuits and gravy. It wasn't just the accuracy of the shot, where to hide close enough and check the direction of the wind. Animals could smell a man and animals knew there were always hunters. Even without the scent, the animals knew to watch carefully for the rising of the rifle to the eye of the hunter. Animals knew what that meant. James, without a rifle, had often walked near an animal, and the animals didn't run. They knew the rifle. James hunkered down in the low shrubs and waited. It was the waiting that took time. Perhaps a rabbit or a possum, or best of all, a deer. James had to make his kill and his name. There was no free ride in the Hicks family. Everyone had to pitch in with the work. Men had to learn to provide, and one rifle and one bullet was the rule. No waste, no second chance. It was cold. James could feel the cold come up through his feet into his crouching legs. He wanted to stretch, but he knew he couldn't move. Stay low, stay quiet. 
James saw some movement across the stream. It could be anything, even another hunter. True, this was Hicks land, but James didn't want to shoot a man. A man had to get dinner. A stream was a good place. James watched and waited. He had to make his shot count. Brother Hank got his game second time out. Already James was the bunt of family jokes. Wait, don't move. The undergrowth moved again. Was the animal testing for shooters? James' legs were going to sleep, but he did not move. His rifle was on target and waiting for a clean shot. James had gone without family dinner three times. He didn't want a fourth time. It wasn't that he was hungry. It was a rite of passage, and he hadn't made it. Some bare sticks rose out of the undergrowth. What was that? He waited. Slowly, a large buck moved carefully forward to the stream. Those sticks were part of an amazing, perfect rack. A very wise buck who had tested his way many times. Now it was safe to lower his head and drink the cool, melted snow water. James was stunned by the beauty of this animal. Nothing James had ever seen was as beautiful as this buck. James waited. He wanted a clean shot. The buck raised his head as a drinking animal will do. That was when James squeezed the trigger, sending the bullet just above the front thighs and into the heart for a clean kill. James ran over, splashing through the stream to the fallen buck. The buck was so beautiful. James was sorry and proud at the same time. One rifle and one shot, he had done it. And it wasn't a rabbit or worse, a squirrel. It was a buck, a grown buck who should be alive. At the same time, he must be dead. James sank to his knees and hugged this huge animal around the neck. You're mine and I'll wear your skin all my life. James, came a cry from the direction of the trees behind James. It was Hank. You did it. Look at it. It's the biggest buck I've ever seen. Hank rose and splashed across the stream. James looked up at Hank. James had tears running down his face. He's mine, said James. Yes, he's yours, replied Hank, and you did it with one shot, clean through the heart. Hank kneeled down beside James and stroked the side of the buck. So beautiful and fat, we'll eat off this forever. Got him so we can carry him home. Through runny nose and tears, James said, He's mine. Yes, you got the best. Fourth try is the lucky one, the boys laughed. James took his side knife and ran it down the stomach of the buck. The boys quickly cleaned out the cavity of the buck and tied the legs to a small sapling they cut so the buck would hang from the pole between them as they walked. Just as they stood up to carry the deer, a sound was heard. The boys looked around and saw a wolf crouching and slinking towards them. <clears throat> this one must have been starving to take a chance with two hunters. He looked fat. Then the boys saw the second wolf and then a third wolf. All the boys had was James' rifle with a spent bullet and Hank's rifle with one bullet. The boys slowly lowered the deer. In times like this, two minds are one as James held his rifle by the barrel to use the rifle as a club. Hank raised his gun to his eyes, hoping if he shot the first wolf, 
it would scare off the others. Bang! went the gun, just as the wolf jumped forward, ruining Hank's shot. The bullet landed towards the stomach of the wolf, not the heart. Damn! was all Hank said as the wolf kept coming towards him. At the same time, James was taking a downward swing at the wolf, hitting him in the neck just behind the ears, a good hit. The wolf went limp and fell. Was it the bullet or the hitting? The boys didn't care. The animal fell. Together as one, they lifted the buck and ran, carrying the buck between them. They didn't drop the rifles. Never drop your rifle. Even if it's empty, they ran as fast as they could with this heavy buck they had to save. They knew one or both would be killed by the two other wolves, but they kept running and stumbling with the deer between them. As they reached the tree, neither was jumped, and they looked to each, then slowed because they were dragging the deer. It was so heavy, and they were so scared. Together they looked back and saw two wolves on top of the first wolf. Both boys started laughing as they picked up their prize and bolted as best they could into the trees. It wasn't far to the house, but they couldn't run and were afraid to walk. They were laughing and laughing again. They couldn't run. The best they could do was a sort of trot and now and then stumble. What a story this would be. And that's the story, one shot. That's the way it was back when my father was a boy, back when maybe your grandfather was a boy. You'd go out with one bullet and one rifle, and you were expected to get dinner. And you did. <laughs> Some of these stories, well, they're going to be lost if somebody doesn't write about them. And that's why I wrote this story, One Shot. Because as we move along, we forget some of the stories. And we forget what our grandparents had to do to survive. Well, this is just a story I wrote. It's not the greatest story in the whole world. But it's about a true incident, and then I just wrote a story around it with James and Hank. Well, now we're going to read another kind of survival, and this is <coughs> by Robert W. Service. He's one of my favorite authors. He wrote a lot about the gold rush up in Alaska, so we're talking about chilly weather. And this is one of my favorite Robert W. Service poems. I hope you like it. <laughs> I love it. And we've got some good pictures to go with this. And special effects. Let's not forget those special effects. This is The Cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold the Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Now, Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, God only knows. <laughs> he was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. Though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold. Through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes would close, then the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, 
and the dogs were fed and the stars o'erhead were dancing heel and toe. He turned to me and, Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking you, won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, It's the cursed cold and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. Yet taint being dead, it's my awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that fair or foul, you'll cremate my last remains. A pal's last need is a thing to heed. So I swore I would not fail. And we started on at the streak of dawn, but God... He looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh and he raved all day about his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death and I hurried horror driven with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, You may tax your brawn and brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were numb, in my heart, how I cursed the land in the long, long night by the lone firelight while the huskies round in a ring howled out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh, God, how I loathe the thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I come to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a thrice it was called the Alice May, and I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then, here, said I with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying round, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared, such a blaze you seldom see, and I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so, and the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke and the inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with my grisly fear, but the stars came out and they danced about ere I ventured near. I was sick with dread. But I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked. It's time I looked. Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heat of the forest roar. 
and he wore a smile you could see a mile, and he said, Please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee. It's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold, and the Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge. I cremated Sam McGee. And there, that's a kind of a survival story. One man survived, and a mother, another man survived also, as long as he sat in a furnace. I hope you like those special effects. Our gentlemen in the control room are in charge of that. Well, we have another story here. This one's just a short one. It's written by an author, and I won't say his name first, because a lot of us today don't even remember him. But during his heyday, he was a very popular author. He was a successful newspaper editor. And he wrote in a review once, this was a review of the play King Lear. He wrote in the review that the actor playing Lear, King Lear, was looking over his shoulder all through the performance to see if there was an ace coming up. Now, if you know your cards, you know an ace beats a king. So that's pretty darn funny. And I think that's pretty darn funny, and it's, of course, the humor of the time, the late 1800s. So who is this forgotten person or overlooked person? Well, his name's Eugene Field. And of course, you may recall some of his more sentimental poems because the times were also sentimental. But I like this poem. It's called The Little Peach. A little peach in the orchard grew, a little peach of emerald hue. Warmed by the sun and wet by the dew, it grew. One day, passing the orchard through, that little peach dawned on the view of Johnny Jones and his sister Sue. Those two. Up at the peach, a club he threw. Down from the tree on which it grew fell the little peach of emerald hue. Mon Dieu. She took a bite, and he a chew, and then the trouble began to brew. Trouble the doctor couldn't subdue, too true. Under the turf where the daisies grew, they planted John and his sister Sue, and their little souls to the angels flew. Boo-hoo! But what of the peach of emerald hue, warmed by the sun and wet by the dew? Ah, well, its mission on earth was through. Adieu. I like that poem. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> well, there's some survival. The two kids didn't make it, and the peach was eaten. But a problem was solved, wasn't it? <laughs> well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. We enjoy getting these things together, the three of us. Uh, we're always looking for something special. And in upcoming weeks, because we have some wonderful special effects that involve either a jumping frog or some kind of moving around thing, we're going to probably, and I know it's true, 
probably be reading Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, and we'll have a flying raven. So don't miss next week or the week after, because we're always trying to do something special. And I'm sure you saw those special furnace flames this week. They were very good. <laughs> Sometimes we hit it right on the mark. Well, all of us want to thank you, Alex Silva Satter, Bryce Parker, and myself. Until next week, this is Ruth Chambers with the Chambers Street Theater. Look for your blessings. They're always there.